Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Uh, today we're going to pick up from where we left off on uh, James chapter 4. We last time finished around verse 3, and so we'll continue on with verse 4. Um, if you remember, it's chapter 4 uh, of, of the epistle of St. James. St. James is teaching his readers and the people who are hearing this message um, about meekness and peace. And so he specifically talks about um, the topic of feuds and, and wars and conflicts that some of the believers are engaging in. And he says in verse 4, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity to, with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so St. James uses uh, bold language here. He, he kind of sounds like one of the uh, prophets from, from old, right? like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel, who says um, adulteresses or adulterers. Um, the idea here is that Christians, believers, are in a covenant with God, likened to a, the covenant that a husband has with his wife or a wife with her husband. And so he's saying that the believers have abandoned this covenant and they've gone after um, someone else, right? Something else. They've gone after man. They've gone after the world. And this kind of intimate relationship, this intimate friendship with the world is at odds with God. And he's saying like, don't You're you know safe. that? Don't you even know something like this is um, something like that is as basic as this, that they have to choose whom they will serve is either God or the world, kind of like Elijah, when Elijah puts the people to the test. Either you, you serve God, either he's Lord or not. The, um, in the book of Revelations, chapter 3, gives a very um, scary warning, warning about being lukewarm, right? Um, so if, it's either God or the world. You must choose. And whoever intends to be a friend of the world, they have to appoint themselves an enemy of God. There's no wiggle room in the middle. And so they imagine maybe perhaps some of the believers believe that they're still friends with God, kind of like Abraham, kind of like James was mentioning in, uh, in uh, James chapter 2, verse 23, when he was um, using the example of Abraham. And, you know, like, what's the harm? I'm just trying to get ahead. But no, St. James completely rejects this sort of thought process. And he says that their greed and the worldliness means that they have abandoned God and are now his um, self-appointed enemy. And they know only too well that, you know, what happens to God's enemies, right? It's, it's, a, very, it's a very clear warning. And we know that this sort of thing, it, it, it causes us to lose peace with God. You know, someone has to wonder, why do we consider the world, the love of the world, an enmity with God? And, and why do we call it to kind of harsh language, call it, spiritual adultery why do we go there you know you know god has created everything for the sake of man so god doesn't want to deprive us of anything but as the bridegroom of the human soul he doesn't want us to cleave to anyone else god wants you know he wants us to use the world and to feel his love without our hearts loving you know it, it's Sometimes we get caught up and we love the gift more than the one who gives the gift, right? God has created the world and saw that it was good. This is Genesis chapter one. But if someone is occupied with the world and does not have time for God, you know, then the world does not become a bridge to cross for eternity. But man is attached to the world and enslaved to the world and all its lusts. And it falls into this trap, right? And then in verse 5, he says, Or do you think that, script, that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Right? St. Jerome says, If God does not love the human soul, he would not have been jealous over her, like a man who is jealous over his bride who loves someone else. So St. James turns to the scripture for confirmation for his kind of rebuke of the envy that motivates them. He quotes from various passages here. The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. That comes from like Isaiah chapter 63. That comes from different parts of the scripture. And so St. James reminds them that God longs for the spirit he made to dwell in them, right? 
And that's really what we're reflecting on this weekend. It just so happens to be the, the Feast of Pentecost tomorrow. And so this is what um, God reminds, he, he longs to um, dwell within us, right? And that's through the Holy Spirit. And so human envy and the pursuit of worldly wealth makes God's enemies, and it makes us God's enemies because he longs for our inner devotion and he doesn't accept any rival, right? And we, we put him at odds with us. In verse six, he says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He grants more grace to the humble who are submitting to his work. And it says clearly that God resists those who trust on themselves, right? Um, and this sort of this sort of thought process who trust in themselves, he's basically saying that they're attached to the spirit of the devil. God gives more grace, more than enough to conquer, this, to conquer sin and to conquer envy. It says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, God opposes the arrogant, but gives grace to the humble. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. They have to become humble to receive God's grace, to receive the Holy Spirit. They must submit themselves before, um, in front of God and return to him, right? And they have to withstand the devil who pushes them to envy and to greed. And, um, and it says in verse 7, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. If we reject the kingdom and the devil, then we first have to accept the kingdom of God by submitting to him. And then we will resist the devil and he will have no dominion over us and he'll actually run away from us. He'll flee from us. St. John Chrysostom, and I forget the exact reference, but he has an amazing commentary where he compares the devil to a dog. And he says that, <clears throat> you know, um, the dog doesn't want to leave his master's table as long as he throws food to him. And if the master stops throwing food, then he will lose hope and he searches for another table to find food. In the same manner, we have to resist the devil continuously and not give him any food. Don't give him any place within us, right? The, the, way, like, the way back to life is open for each one of us. If St. James is saying, if they would just draw near to God, in repentance. He will draw near to them in return. In fact, in verse five, we just read, you know, he longs for them. He longs for them. Um, you know, they consider themselves faithful, but in reality, they're sinners, double-souled, men who um, confess faith in God while they serve the world. Can't have it both ways, you know? So the question is, how do we submit to God and resist the devil? Well, St. James says in verse eight, we need to draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You know, one of the amazing examples of this is the example of the prodigal son and, and the loving father. The loving father saw his son returning to him and he had compassion on him and he ran to him and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. Again, this is a clear image of what it means to draw near to God and he will draw near to you. As soon as we return to God, he will return to us. He's not far from us. He said in, in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. You know, and he gives a very um, interesting mark here. He says, cleanse your hands. St. James reflects on this and he says, you know, their hands are dripping with blood. The ones that they oppressed. Right? St. James asks and directs them to cleanse their hands, to purify their greedy hearts by that determination to help the poor so that they, you know, both their outer actions and their inner motivations show their faith. Repentance has to be more than talk, right? This is a common theme. It has to be more than talk. It has to be more than just feelings. It has to be more than emotions, but behavior and life and action. That's why St. James asked us to have, what, pure hands or pure works, in other words. In verses 9 and 10, he says, Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves 
in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Now is a time for repentance and fasting. He's saying, let now, let the rich now be miserable and mourn and weep for their sins. Let the laughter of their unrighteous feasting turn into mourning. Let their selfish joy be turned into gloom as they fast and they consider their sins. If they will just be humbled before the Lord, he will exalt them. It's a very amazing promise. He will forgive and he will restore them. You know, in one of the, the writings of the life of St. Pocomius, it was mentioned that one night, St. Pocomius and his disciple um, Tedros passed by a cemetery where they found some women that were, that were crying, they were weeping. And St. Pocomius was touched by the scene. And he, he said he desired that all may weep for their sins so that they may rise. Right? He told his disciple, the, um, Tedros, he said, do you see those who shed their tears on the dead, on the dead people who cannot rise? How about us monks who should lament our dead souls so that the Lord Jesus may raise us with his mercy? Weeping is beneficial. Um, David, the psalmist said in Psalm 5, verse 6, he said, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Joseph wept for his brothers. Jeremiah wept for his people. And it's a warning. St. James was afraid that while they pray with tears, this may cause them to think that they're better than others and lose their blessings. One of the, one of the fathers say, when you pray with tears, don't brag about that, right? Thinking that you are better than others, but that confessing your sins has granted you tears, which, which brought about God's compassion. That's why we weep, right? He says in verse 11, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. And so St. James here, he, he kind of comes to an end of his argument here um, with his like, last, like his last appeal. He, he doesn't want them to speak against one another. Right In the past, they cursed and reviled their neighbor and there was fighting and there was, yeah, there was fighting and contentions among them. But he's saying no more, no more of that. The one speaking against the brother or judging his brother in reality speaks against the law and judges the law. And this is, these are very harsh words for the, for the pious Jew. This is unthinkable for, for a Jew to go against the law. The law commands us to what? To love our neighbor. This is in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. The law commands us to love our neighbor. So, and, and to condemn our brother is to condemn the law. And, and this is a big defilement of the commandment. And so we see that earthly desires make us lose our peace with people, right? We saw that the love of earthly matters makes us lose our inner peace and our peace with God. And it defiles our outlook towards others so that we judge them, we rebuke them, and we see that they're evil people. St. James says, no, in verse 11, he says, but if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. You know, we should cover the mistakes of one another, being compassionate to all. And then in verse 12, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Who are you to judge another? Anyone would, would presume to judge and to condemn the law is not a doer of the law, right? As again, all, all Jews strive to be. They, they want this, this was, was the peak, right? Instead, um, this person who is, they become a, a judge. And that's really to take over God's role. He alone is the one lawgiver and the one judge. He is the only one who is able to save and to destroy. Do they imagine that the, the power of life and death is within them, that's basically what he's saying. Then, then let God be judge alone and let them stop from judging their brothers, right? Who are they to think they can claim God's role? And I think we all fall into this trap. It's a reminder that he alone is the only judge who puts the law of love and mercy and is able to save and to condemn. In verse 13 and 14, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? 
It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. St. John Chrysostom says very, something very nice. He says, life here is just a path, but our dwelling is in things to come. Matters of this present life satisfy the spring, but the life to come is like a rock which cannot be destroyed. It's, it's the very foundation of our being. The reason for our being entices the lusts and being occupied with earthly matters is not realizing the fact of our being um, sojourners in this earth. And, and, and maybe to even stretch it so far as to say, we try to forget that fact. We try to forget that we're only here temporarily. That's why St. James rebukes us with these verses of 13 and 14. St. James now begins another teaching. He urges his hearers to be content and to humbly submit to God, whatever their circumstances are. He, he begins by saying, come now. You know, he kind of challenges his hearers to defend themselves. Come now, right? In particular, he addresses those who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go into this or that city and do business for a year there and trade and make profit. Once again, the rich are addressed. And St. James takes aim at their claim and their pride. You know, these ones proudly assume they have power over their own lives. We do too. We feel the same way. They don't understand and cannot guess what their life will be like tomorrow. Tomorrow, they may or may not be able to go into this city or to that city. And if they do, they may not live to spend a day there, much less a year, right? Nor do they know if God does spare them to live a year, whether they're going to make a profit or endure a loss. In other words, they assume their own power. But in reality, you know, they're just a vapor. We're all just a vapor. Something that appears for just a little while and then disappears. You know, the human life vanishes as quickly as the, as the, morning, as the morning mist. And so we can, you know, not presume that our life is in our control and it will last forever. It's, it's, a, it's an important reminder. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance and all boasting, all such boasting is evil. This is verses uh, 15 and 16. It was custom to go to new cities and to make business for a whole year and then go back to their old city. He didn't rebuke them for that. But because they did not submit their will to the hands of God, but trusted in themselves, their, their, you know, their planning and wisdom became arrogant. And instead of this you know, self-confidence, they ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and we will also do this and we'll also do that. If they... You know, they can plan freely. We all have the ability to plan as much as we want. But in humility, right, we have to confess that all human planning is completely dependent on the will of God. Maybe we will live through the night. Maybe not, right? And if we live, maybe we will fulfill our plans that we had for ourselves. Maybe not, right? All is in the hands of God. And refusal to acknowledge this shows our our vain boastings, as St. James says it, right? Our vain boastings, our arrogance. It's, a, it's not a sign of, of good behavior, right? It's not a sign of being a go-getter, right? No, it, he's saying this is evil. This kind of boasting, this kind of arrogance, um, not understanding that we're in the hands of God, this is evil. And then he concludes uh, chapter 14 with verse 17. He says, therefore to him, who knows to do good and does not do it, this uh, to him it is sin. Now that St. James has brought their attention to their arrogance, right? The idea um, to refuse humility is sin, pure and simple, right? Sins of omission bring God's judgment, just as sins of commission, right? Knowing it is sin and still doing it. And so it, it's like, he is responding to their question. Is this act considered sin? We did not, you know, we did not harm anyone or transgress against the law. So why do you blame us? You know, we're not doing, we're neutral. We didn't do anything wrong. Um, no doubt that trusting, that not trusting in God is a sin. But St. James answered in a better way. He said, to him who knows to do good, that is to trust in God, and not earthly desires, 
and does not do that, to him it is sin. So he clarifies that, to clarify that point. I wanted to briefly touch on uh, the beginnings of chapter five today, um, and hopefully we'll finish um, the entire book of James next time, uh, next Saturday. But chapter five is really focused around faith and being occupied with riches and really being faithful in all circumstances. And you can kind of see the breakdown of the chapter. Um, in the beginning few verses, um, he discusses the, the earthly lusts and um, he addresses the issues and dangers of being preoccupied with riches. And then um, in the later half of, this, of the chapter, he talks about how to be faithful in all circumstances in life, in sorrow, in joy, in sickness, in these kind of things. And so we'll kind of take it from there. Um, and so chapter five really encourages his readers to be patient under suffering and, um, and really focusing in the beginning part, uh, how do you be faithful while being occupied with riches? What does that even mean? And so with verses one, two, and three, we read, come now you rich weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and you will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last day. These are strong words. This is a very strong uh, couple of verses. St. James is asking the rich, trusting in their riches, to weep and howl. Those rich who oppress the poor Jewish workers, right? The rich who have stored up an immense wealth. How? By breaking the backs of the workers, by oppression, by treasuring up riches of grain and garments, which, by the way, garments and that, those kind of things were a source of wealth in those days right, and gold and silver. And on the day of judgment, they will find their produce has rotten, right? Their garments have become moth-eaten and even their gold, which, you know, which really can't corrode and their silver have supernaturally corroded, right? The fact is that these have been stored up and left to rot and not used to help the poor to whom they were owed, right? It will be a witness against them. So he's saying, let them weep and howl for the miseries that will be coming upon them at that judgment. And this you know, type of unjust wealth will eat their flesh as fire, fueling the flames of hell. These are very strong, strong words. He says in verse four, indeed the wages of the laborers who moved your fields, which you keep back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, you know? The, the love of riches makes one lose mercy towards his brother, but drives one to unjustly treat his servant. The reward and the wage of those workers have their wages being withheld from them so that the poor starved during the recent famine that we talked about um, and the, the ones who died in their poverty. So it is as if the rich sentence them as guilty and murdered the righteous themselves. And so this cry is like the blood of Abel, asking for revenge according to the scriptures, right? The worker shouts to God for justice. And though they seem to go unheard, they have entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the commander of the heavenly armies, who is strong to avenge his people he is able to defend the oppressed. That's, that's the, the significance of that term. In verses five and six, you have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fatted your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. It's a warning of a life of luxury. You know, it's not wrong to have wealth. It's not wrong to have luxury, but it's a warning, right? It is not... Um, our Lord says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? You know, indulgence in luxuries, it deprives, it deprives us of controlling ourselves. That's why the Lord is warning us. He says in Luke chapter 21, verse 34, he says, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and cares for this life and the day 
and that day come on you unexpectedly. The rich think they'll live forever, right? And justice will never find them out. They should have known the day of judgment was fast approaching and used their wealth to help the poor. You know, that's the correct use of the wealth. That's being a good steward. They use their riches to live indulgently and to, to revel in their luxury, right? They nourish and fatten their hearts with their constant feasting and their excess. You know, they don't know they're like the calves that are only being fattened for the day of slaughter. It's as if the rich sentence them as, as guilty and murder the righteous themselves. The poor and the powerless worker did not withstand them because he wasn't able to do so. Okay, and we'll end here in, in verse 7 for today. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. St. James turns to address his brothers with tenderness and compassion. Those who are suffering under the oppression of the rich should be patient. You know, there were uh, zealots in Israel at that time who were tempted to take matters into their own hands and to violently overthrow those who oppressed them. They were going to do it themselves. They were going to take matters into their own hands. St. James says, once and for all, close that door. They must wait until the coming of the Lord. And, and we'll stop there for today. And glory be to God forever. Amen. And